central concepts are there. One is nafaqa. That is the duty of the husband to provide for the wife. And the classical jurist defined it as food, shelter, and clothing. Some included medicine, some did not do that. Different opinions. So that is the right of the woman to demand it. But the right of the husband, which becomes the duty of the wife, is to submit to him, to obedience. If you remember, when we go back to the verse, it is taken from that concept. But the classical jurists define obedience only in sexual terms. Legally speaking, she is obliged to obey him only in sexual terms, i.e. to be available. And from this comes the idea, or the right, that the husband has got the right to control her wife's movement. Because, you know, she must be always available. So it is the legal logic of it that uh, I want you to just pay attention. And the third element is the neshus, the rebellion. If a wife does not obey, then she loses her right to maintenance. And that is nowhere in the verse, that is a link that the jurist made between woman's right to maintenance and this is contingent on them to be obeying uh, the husband. So this is really the bare bone of a marriage contract. And please remember that what I'm talking about is on classical juristic terms. And of course, and no doubt that there were differences and debates among the jurists and the whole uh, uh, Muslim legal tradition and fair is about these differences. And these differences uh, are important. But what is important is that the concept of nafaqa, that the husband has a duty to provide and the wife has a duty to obey, and in the, shoes, if she, in the shoes, if she does not obey, she uses her right to maintenance, is something that all jurists agreed. So it is something which there was no uh, dispute about it. And whether these rulings corresponded to actual practices of marriage and gender relations is another area of inquiry. One that the recent scholarship in Islam has started to uncover. And basically what this recent scholarship in Islam shows that we should not take fair discourse or juristic discourse at face value. The practice of the courts were totally different. The practice on the ground were totally different. This is a discourse. This is what the juries are producing. And I think this is the value of the feminist scholarship because, you know, once we have a law, there must be a reason for it. So the reason that the jurists were so strict on women, sometimes I ask why. Were women resisting? Were they too powerful? What was the reason that you know, the construction became so patriarchal? Now going back to Kawama, uh, yes. Now I'm going to back to the concept of kawama, male authority. This has been subject of debates since the beginning of 20th century, and I won't have gone, uh, time to go around this, but if you're interested, we can talk about it. I think the first person who started to challenge it, challenge its theological validity and juristic validity within the Muslim legal tradition is a scholar called Tahir Haddad and he was a Tunisian. And the second uh, scholar which provided a systemic way of thinking about it is Fazlur Rahman, again a, pa a Pakistani scholar. And now we have the feminist scholarship that are producing a new sets of knowledge. And I really want to just to show and share with you one of the examples of this feminist scholarship that we have. And this is for a um, uh, paper that Umayma Abu Bakr, uh, an Egyptian scholar, is doing for our project Musaba. And what Abu Bakr does in this, um, uh, on her work is, she, is that she documents the significant changes in the tafsir, in the interpretive uh, literature, 
of understanding of verse 434 in past uh, 10th century. So she looks at the tafsir literature and how the jurists understood and how the interpreters of the Quran constructed this concept of the woman. She shows how and through what processes the first part of the verse that says al-rajalur al nisa men are qawamun let's not translate it qawamun of the women became continually reinterpreted until it became a patriarchal construct it became a construct which really became trans uh, textual she identifies four stages in this inter uh, reinterpretation. The first stage is that the sentence, the first sentence was isolated from the rest of the Quran and turned into an independent and separate part. It, because this sentence is part of a verse and this verse is part of a bigger uh, 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 chapter of the Quran, Surah Al-Nisa, which is a, with the title of women, and this chapter is a part of the Quran itself. And it is really the first step is isolating it. And this was done by changing kawamun, which is an adjective, into an infinitive, into a mastak. And from it comes the noun kawama, which means authority. And the second stage is when the concept of kawama, when it was created, <coughs> was consolidated, and rational arguments and justifications were provided for hierarchical relationship between men and women. In the third stage, Kawana was expanded and, uh, by linking to the other ideas that men have advantage over women. And basically here, it was by linking Kawana to the word Daraja, which comes in another verse in the Quran in 228, which is that verse is about divorce. And at the end of that verse, it says that men have a degree over women, but it is a degree over women because they can divorce women. But that is taken totally out of context. And so Daraja, that men have a degree over women, and Kawama, that men have authority uh, over women, became you know, the basis of the theological faith. And then we go to the, uh, the final stage, and that final stage came with the modernist time. At the end of the 19th century, when Kawama was linked with the theory of naturalness, uh, natural, uh, natural, uh, naturalness of Islamic law and the ideology of domesticity using the studio psychological uh, knowledge that men and women are different, they have different natures, and women are emotional, men are rational, and all this sort of psychological uh, knowledge. And it is, it is actually an eye-opener, because until this study, for somebody like me, I didn't know that Kawama is not a Quranic concept. Kawama is a juristic construct. And this, you know, something that uh, a large majority of women, men and women in Muslim uh, context do not know. So this is a background. So far what I have said is how Kawama, how the notion of patriarchy was constructed in the classical time, in the pre-modern times. But now let's go to the modern times to see and how it's been translated into a set of legal uh, rulings. In the course of the 20th century, as nation states emerged among Muslim population, classical fair conceptions of marriage and divorce were partially reformed and codified and grafted onto a modern legal system in many Muslim majority uh, contexts. And uh, I think the context is important. When the first phase of the codification happened, it happened in the context of encounter of Muslim countries, majority countries with modernity, and also with colonialism, and with the nationalistic movement. So it was part of the nation building. And uh, what happened during this phase is that we can say generally Muslim countries took three parts. One was by Turkey, only one country, which put 
Islamic legal tradition aside in all areas of law and adopted a Western-based legal tradition, including family law, adopted Swiss code. Another part, which is again a minority one, was taken by Saudi Arabia, which kept fair classical jurisprudence intact without grafting it onto modern uh, legal system. But the majority of Muslim countries, while they put Islamic legal tradition, Islamic legal concept aside in most areas of law, they kept it in the family law. So family law was the only law that is based on fiqh. Of course, they introduced reforms. But by codifying it, by marrying it to the state, and having the machinery of a modern state behind it, they changed the nature of these laws. Because classical fiqh emerged as a law which is a jurist law, absolutely independent from the state at least theoretically. Whereas when it is codified, what you do in the codification is you select one interpretation from one school, from one opinion. Then you make it into a code. So you fix that interpretation. And that fluidity, that flexibility is taken away. Reforms were introduced by bringing principles from different schools by patching together. And the reforms basically focused on two areas. One was increasing women's uh, age of marriage, and another one was restricting the husband's unilateral right to divorce and talaq. But the essence of the conception of marriage, the notion of men have authority over women was not challenged. And I think it is important. It is important in certain ways. Important in the sense that the, once it is not challenged, once uh, the state takes upon itself to impose a patriarchal model of the family, it actually gives religious patriarchy a new force. Because now the state can bring it. And another thing is that the, these states in Muslim context that introduced these reforms, they were secular states. Therefore, they did not have the legitimacy to open the classical text and reinterpret it. And the ulama and the juries who had this legitimacy, they were pushed aside from the state with the secular uh, education. Therefore, you know, they were really mm, becoming more and more defensive. The, I think it is important in a sense because it changes the nature of the relationship between Muslim legal tradition and the practice. If we look at the pre-modern context, you know, a judge is not employed by the state. It's, th this judge is answerable to the community, so has got to go by the standards of the community. And uh, the research shows that in pre-modern time, until 19th, 20th century, women had much better access to justice. They could do what we can call it now forum shopping. If they were not happy with one school of law, they could go to a judge who applied another school of law. And if they were not happy with this judge, they could go to another judge. Whereas now, the judge is only accountable to the state. It is employee of the state. So the nature of the law changes, and the law no longer is defined by the jurists, it is defined by the legislative uh, assemblies. But everything starts to change after 1979. And I really see 1979 as a turning point. And creates a new, uh, new dynamic. Two events in 1979 became marked that year as a turning point. The first one was the Iranian Revolution of 1979, which basically we can say it is the acme of the political Islam. It is when that Islam as a spiritual and political force really came and captured the imagination of all Muslims. And the Iranian Revolution had so much promise then, but now we know what it is. But it wasn't there. It was an unknown entity, political Islam. And, this, and uh, the second event is 
CEDA, the United Nations Assembly, adopting the Convention Against All Forms of Discrimination uh, Against Women, which is known as Women's Charter. The idea of gender equality was there in human rights law from the very beginning, but it's really the CEDA. This convention gave it a new legal force. And what we see in 1980s and 1990s is actually confrontation between two different frames of references, two different movements. On the one hand is political Islam, with its, its claim of return to Sharia, which we must read it now as return to fiqh, classical fiqh. What we see in 1979 is a reversal of what started at the beginning of the 20th century. In the beginning of 20th century, we are seeing the process of codification, secularization of laws and legal systems. In 1979, we see a return to it, the process of Islamization. In 1979, the family law in Iran, which was introduced, introduced reform in 1967, was dismantled. In Egypt, a law that gave women the right to stay in the marital home after divorce was put aside. In Pakistan, the Hudud ordinances came, which for the first time really extended the ambit of FEB, Islamic jurisprudence to the area of criminal law. And before 1979 and Hudud, criminal law was not applied in any Muslim context. Then Nigeria, Iran, and all this. Other. So these are really new developments. But then what is happening in 1980 is that we see the rise of women's organization, NGOs, women's independent organization. This women's organization in the Muslim context did not exist before 1980s. They are now linked with an international feminism, with the human rights, and what the CEDO and human rights give them is the language that they need. The language to really in a, the fight for their rights, the kind of uh, legitimacy. So in 1980s, 1990s, we see the clash of it. But by the mid-1990s, this clash also produces a dialogue, a dialogue, a constructive dialogue between Muslim legal tradition and in human rights and feminism. And this dialogue is what really gave rise to the new consciousness, which is known as Islamic feminism. And it is against the backdrop of this development that Musaba as a movement emerged, because it really needs to be seen as the child of its time. And another point which was so important was after 9-11, because what happened after 9-11 was that somehow, human rights discourses and feminism started to lose their legitimacy. Because it was in the name of human rights and women's right that Afghanistan was invaded, Iraq was invaded, to save women and to bring democracy. But there is no way that you save women and bring democracy through violent means. So in so many ways, Muslim women really found themselves in crossfire. Either, you know, they had to accept the kind of imperialist feminism imposed on them by a different set of agendas, by a global interests, or accept an interpretation of Islam like Taliban. And it is, you know, in this that there are women who come and say, no, we do not accept any any kind of feminism, at the same time, not any kind of interpretation of Islam. And against this background that we came uh, to organize uh, Musaba as a movement. And one central question that confronts us in what we are doing is how to negotiate the wide gap between the conceptions of justice that inform classical fair and also the human rights legislation. And how the core concept of Islamic legal theory such as Qawama can be reconstructed in line with contemporary notions of justice. It is here that the works of the new wave of Islamic reform thinkers of are immense importance. Because there has been really groundbreaking work in Islamic uh, reform thinking in the 1990s and since then. 
The interpretive epistemological theories that these new thinkers are developing in the light of contemporary state of knowledge using the conceptual tools and theories of other branches of knowledge are taking the Islamic legal thought into new grounds. Their conceptual tools are absolutely important. For instance, the distinction between religion, deen, and religious knowledge, marifat dini That religion is sacred, but any of uh, understanding of religion is actually human. It develops in conversation, in a dialogue with other branches of knowledge. Therefore, there is nothing sacred about our understanding of religion. And for Muslim, the sacred part is the Quran and the Hadith. But any of the understanding of that is open to questions. Or the distinction between Sharia and Fiqh. You know, it was there in the classical time. But now it, it is brought to the surface. And also the discussion that what is mutable and what is immutable in the Quran, do we take every uh, verse in the Quran and the face value, or we go beyond it? Is it a literal understanding? And these are the debates which are really there. I want to conclude here because I would like to have some space for discussion. The Awana project that we have is developing. It has two main elements. One element is the production of new feminist knowledge. And I shared with you one of them, which was Umayma Abu Bakr's work, which is on specifically, specifically on the interpretations of 434. There is another study looking at the concept of qawama in relation to other concepts in the Quran as a whole. Then there is another study on tradition, on ethical side, on the Sufi. So there are eight papers there. And the second element of the research that we have, it really involves lived experiences of women and men. So documentation of life stories of Muslim women in different countries. We have 12 teams, and one of the teams at the Hoda Mubassari is with us working on these life stories. We really are trying to understand how Qawama impacts women in different stages of their life. Because before they are married, they are under the authority of the father. After marriage, this authority is transferred to the father, to the husband. And then you know how they deal with it. And as a, it's not only stories of women, stories of the families. And that is why when you mentioned we want to start from the context, then go back to the text. Because the Quran needs to be understand, understood in its context, the principles of justice. And uh, I want to uh, conclude by making two points. The first point is that what we are doing in Mosaba is to insert women's concerns and voices into the processes of the production of religious knowledge and legal reform. We do this by linking the scholarship with activism and by bridging two gaps in the Muslim family law debates and in the Muslim